Witcher 4 and nine other games we don't expect this gen next gen console watch let's see I don't know if this is going to be interesting or not but uh but we'll see welcome back to next gen console watch our show following everything happening with next gen games and hardware I'm Damon Hadfield and joining me this week is Max Scoville host of iGen's PlayStation podcast podcast beyond hey, hey. and Jada Griffin iGen's head of community joins us as well welcome back Jada hey how's it going it's going great and this week, uh, we're actually going to talk about... I'm sorry, Jada, I'm blocking your, your face. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it's just like sitting right in front of it. I can move that here. I can also move the move the chat. There we go. I'll just do that. Okay. Now we can see everybody's beautiful faces. Yeah, Max has been around forever. Like, he's been around for ages. Damon, I feel like I see him and I recognize him, but he also... And this is not like shade. I just like genuinely... I think he's just... He's got one of those like kind of blend into the crowd faces. You know, like I, when I think about it, yeah, he's hosted, he hosted that video. We just watched the, the Batman Arkham thing on or the, the Batman canceled game thing on. So he was hosting that. I'm pretty sure that was him, but you know, he just blends into the back, uh, it blends into the crowd, which is funny, but Max is like, OG, OG. He's been around forever. He's also got one of those faces where I cannot tell if he's 22 or if he's 48, no idea. He could be any no clue uh and jada i am not familiar with jada and jada griffin igen's head of community joins us as well welcome back jada hey how's it going it's going great and this week uh we're actually going to talk about some next gen games we're well aware as some of you like to point out in the comments from time to time that the playstation 5 and xbox series x are not next gen consoles anymore we understand but that's what the show is called but today let's actually talk about some next gen games more um specifically games that are announced and are coming and we're looking forward to, but we do not expect them to come during this. Oh, that was, that was subtle. That was good. As a streamer and a YouTuber, I can appreciate what just happened. Did you guys see what happened with Max? Did you see, did you see what happened? It's very subtle. I'm sorry. I did him dirty with this pause. Watch, watch what's going to happen. He's going to yawn and he's going to keep it very, very, controlled because the camera's on him so he's doing like the mouth cracked trying to yaw very intensely but i spotted it because i do that all the time if you're tired you got to cover it up but you don't want to like yawn super aggressively it was called watch but today let's actually talk about some next gen games there's more, the yawn um, specifically <laughs> there it is that are announced and are coming and we're looking forward to but we do not expect oh recover um, okay during this generation <laughs> i they have not been given a, any sort of release window or date yet so for example, let's begin with something like The Witcher 4 uh, from CD Projekt Red. I believe this is uh, the game that they're focusing on the most right now. It's, we, we know that they have several games currently in development. I, I kind of think The Witcher 4 will be their next game, even if it's... I agree. Witcher 4, I'm guesstimating. Let's take our guesses in the chat. Let's take our guesses in the chat. I think we get The Witcher 4 in 2020. I'm going to go I'm going to go ballsy. I'm I'm going 2028. I don't think we get it till 2028. I think they don't want another Cyberpunk 2077 situation. I think they reveal it before that cuz I think they probably have marketing deals with Epic. So I think that they probably are going to showcase it a year and a half, two years in advance. We'll see trailers for it constantly cuz it's going to be the big thing to show look what a next gen or a current gen, but at that point it might actually be a next gen like uh, unreal engine game so i fully expect we'll see a lot of it but i don't think it's coming till 2028 yeah 2028 i think we get it then and then they probably do a next gen update like a year later as like a witcher 4 2.0 thing because that worked great for cyberpunk just do that it's not out this generation max what do you think i think it's a safe bet yeah they recently did an earnings call saying that something like 64 percent of the company is is working on it right now i think it's like 400 out of 650 employees something like that uh, that's, that's up a bit from the last time they did this around, which is, uh, you know, last winter. And they said it was around half the company, uh, a bunch of people that were working on cyberpunk have since, you know, shifted over and they're now focusing on that. Um, yeah, all we know about that right now is that it's going to be running at unreal five and you know, they want it, they want it to be real good. You know, it's, it's not just going to be sort of like, you know, another Witcher three running in a new engine. It's, I think they really want to try to completely, you know, considerably up the ante and, if you look at the jump between the Witcher One and the Witcher Two, and the Witcher Two and Witcher Three, I feel like it's a safe safe to assume that it's going to be a pretty ambitious project. So we might be waiting around a cool minute for that. And uh, yeah, I think back in 2022 they said uh, not to expect it for at least three years. And you know, knowing CDPR, it, it takes them a cool minute to make games. So 
you know, I, I'm I'm all for just letting this cook and giving it as much time in the oven as it needs as uh, you know, hopefully some lessons were learned with the Cyberpunk 2077 launch. I agree. I think they're going to take a, a hot minute. They're going to take their time with it because they really don't want to blow this one either. Um, I think that's part of the reason they also are choosing to go with Unreal because they can have all of Epic's staff backing it. Because this is the other thing. The Witcher 4's quality and performance will reflect on Epic and Unreal Engine. So what do you have now? You have a team in the form of Unreal and their, their engine staff that has a direct incentive to polish the ever-living hell out of The Witcher 4. And I think that's part of the, the incentive of choosing to partner with them on it. So I, I think that we're going to see a lot of that. I mean, I, I really think that we're going to see not just CDPR working on refinement and polishing and stuff. I think they're going to be really, really going balls to the walls with it. Um, I still think that they might have a current gen ps5 and uh series x version of the game because again I, I fully expect that we'll see this advertised for like a year or two because i think it's going to showcase the power of the unreal engine a lot and i think epic really would love that um because they know how much that's going to hype up the engine and make it look even better and potentially get other big corporate clients to sign on and i i don't think that they would start showcasing it like a year in advance of the playstation 6 for example and and do that i think that they probably have a current gen version and then they'll do a next gen update um for the ps6 and everything and sell that full price again I mean, that's what I would expect. Yeah, I think it's going to be a next-gen game. Um, there is a possibility Subtle. that they... That's good. I don't know if it's uh, falling into the trap again of doing a uh, multiple, multiple console launch where it's mm -hmm. tail end of PS5, beginning of PS6, Point. like they did with Cyberpunk. And obviously, we saw how well that worked out for them. Um, so hopefully, they are just kind of learning their lessons and just going for a PS6, Xbox, next Xbox, and just you know pc release um but you know i could see them still trying to cash in on the ps5 audience because the ps5 audience has the numbers there's so many people with ps5s it's really hard for a developer to release their next massive game that they're going to be uh you know counting on for income uh to not be in the bigger install bases yeah i honestly i don't see it being a launch title i just think like there's so little incentive for third-party devs that are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a game. There's so little ex incentive to put that on a launch console in the launch window. Because, like, even if the console goes crazy and does, like, 5, 10 million units in the first quarter or something, you still could have 100 million uh, possible buyers on the last gen. Like, yeah, it's going to look great. And when people buy the console, eventually they're going to buy your game with it probably, but it just would make more sense to release on the big install base and then bring a next gen version later. It just, I know it's, it's easy to just be like, oh, well, they just need to do that. Like they did with cyberpunk. The thing with cyberpunk though, was that cyberpunk was supposed to release before the next gen consoles that was supposed to come out. Like their goals internally, apparently were, were to put it out much faster. So I, I just don't see them doing that. I think we still see Witcher for this gen and then a quick next gen update later. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of the Witcher 4 probably in the year leading up to its launch. I think it's going to be a showcase game that we'll see at all of those epic events and Unreal Engine demos. I could see them waiting till PS6, but I think they will probably also do a PS5, PS6, and Xbox Series X, S, and whatever YZ, the next Xbox, oh, ends yeah. up being called. Here's hoping they have those, the current gen versions optimized, uh, unlike Cyberpunk yes. 2077. But speaking of Cyberpunk, we know that CD Projekt Red is also working on the Cyberpunk sequel, Cyberpunk 2, 2078, whatever it's called. We know it's got a code name Orion, and they currently have 47 devs, around 47 devs, working on it in a newly formed Boston-based studio. But development on this one just began after the release of Phantom Liberty last September. So this one's in its very early stages. Definitely expecting this one next generation. Max, you agree? Yeah. Yeah, completely. I, if you know, if The Witcher Four is technically out when there's a new console generation around, I very, I think it's very likely that it's going to be cross gen. Um, I, you know, just to Jada's point, I think the install base is a pretty good motivator to get as get this game onto as many systems as possible. But for Cyberpunk, I think that's definitely going to be squarely a next gen release. I don't think that's going to be hitting this mm -hmm. generation. I could be wrong, but you know, given the amount of time it takes to make these games, that um, yeah, that's going to be. 
that's going to be a sizable installment. Quick question for both of you. Mm -hmm. Which one do you feel like you're more of a fan of, uh, The Witcher or Cyberpunk today? Real quick, everybody in chat, I want to know, Witcher or Cyberpunk, where are you at? I think I'm more of a Witcher fan. Honestly, I've always been more fantasy than I have been sci-fi and like uh, cyberpunk ended up really, really good. But I just think personally, I'm, I'm big into the Witcher, big into the Witcher, especially like when it's at its peak and the music hits and then you go and you start hunting your, you know, your, your monster target or whatever. Oh God. It's so good. Okay. Some votes coming back in for cyberpunk. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So it seems to lean a little bit more Witcher heavy, but it's it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Okay, so not quite two thirds. It's closer to half half than anything, but I mean, little bit more leaning into Witcher, little bit more. Might just be because we've had a little bit of, of a break from the Witcher. So, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder or something, whatever the saying is. So maybe that's part of it, but yeah, I love me some Witcher. Ooh. Um... I'd say aesthetics and wise, I love cyberpunk for its looks, but gameplay and story wise, Witcher every day mm. of the week. Mm. Um, Witcher and its side quests, everybody knows Witcher 3 has some of the best side quests writing and best side quests like of all games. Uh, and like that's that's what I'm looking for most forward to is Witcher 4, hands down. Max, how about you? That's a tough one. I was I I have such a complicated I relationship with with Cyberpunk because I had such lofty expectations. Like I got excited for the the Witcher three when I saw that demo because I heard they were working on on Cyberpunk. Like I, I devoted mm. my full attention to what CDPR was doing when they announced Cyberpunk way back in twenty twelve or thirteen or whenever that was. Uh, it's you know it's a great game. It definitely finally found its footing. But like it's I I feel like my my one weird hang up is that there's a bunch of stuff that we can do in real life we can't do in the futuristic version of cyber you can't call an uber you know like that's such a weird and it's you know there's that just you know lunar narrative distance or whatever but in a fantasy realm i'm willing to forgive you know like oh you got to fast travel to a signpost or whatever it's it's i don't know uh that said like going back and playing the witcher 3 at this point that's a phenomenal game in its own right but there are parts of it that are showing its age uh you know mm -hmm. it still stands up phenomenally visually it looks great uh it, there, i feel like there's some stuff in there that could use fine tuning and also i want to see what happens when they are able to just focus on making the game rather than trying to develop an engine at the same time. Uh, mm. Both, you know, uh, Witcher 3 and, and uh, Cyberpunk were in, I think, the Red Engine, which was a, you know, proprietary in-house thing that they had to build from the ground up. The fact that they're dedicating, you know, resources to just working out of Unreal 5 is, I guess, promising, you know? That's yeah. one less thing for them to worry about. It's crazy to think of that, like, <laughs> there's, like, half of the, the consideration of all this that now you just don't have to stress about. Maybe you'd still do stress about it, but instead of you having to fix it, you just call your your contact over at Epic. And you're like, uh, Gary, the hell, there's this bug. The engine keeps glitching out when we try to add in this texture on this object because it can't track and trace to this many vertices. So uh, can you lift that cap and get this working again, Gary? And then he takes care of it because Gary's a Chad. It's going to be great or terrible. Who knows? We're going to find out. It's a big, big leap. I mean, it, it's very different, but I, as I've said many times before, the fact that cyberpunk looked and ran so amazing and they chose to, and that's after all the patches to be very, very clear. And they're choosing to abandon that tech to go with unreal to me, makes it clear that they probably saw something behind closed doors that Epic was doing that was like, Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Let's do this. Because that's that's wild. Well, speaking of uh, things you can do in real life that you can't do in video games, we all walk around with a map of the Earth in our pockets. But Starfield shipped without any maps. And Starfield was made by Bethesda, and Bethesda has uh, other games in the works, obviously that are quite a ways off. Uh, I believe the next one, you know, uh, not they have Indiana Jones coming later this year, um, of course. But the next one after that, you know, the big one is Elder Scrolls. Six. This one was announced back in 2018, so it's already been six years since that was announced. Yeah, do you feel old yet? That announcement for the Elder Scrolls Six was six years ago. That's wild. That's wild. Honestly, I'm kind of with you, Bedtime. I'm surprised that, like, we're talking about CDPR, and then we're talking about, like, Rockstar, and we're talking about all these huge studios uh, that are wildly successful. 
I'm honestly still surprised that Bethesda gets brought up in the conversation because to me, I, I'm like, it's been over a decade since they were dropping like these games that were on that level. Because with Fallout 3, absolutely on that level. With Skyrim, absolutely on that level. It started a, a fire, a forest fire of hype. People were obsessed with that game. It is like a social phenomenon is how big that game was. And then Fallout 4, a little less so. It was like not terrible, but it wasn't great. And then Fallout 76 burned all goodwill they had. And then Starfield disappointed some of their most hardcore fans and their modding community has abandoned it largely. Um, like I was working on a video. I was working on a video where I was like, okay, I tried to fix Starfield with mods. There aren't enough mods out to like make a decent video because like all the modders have abandoned it and moved on to like going and working on Fallout 4 or Skyrim still. Like it's crazy. It's crazy. And I would have never have thought that that would be the case, but that's where we are now. So I'm just always surprised that we still get it brought up in these conversations. It's just surprising. Leaked FTC documents uh, from the Microsoft Activision trial um, said it won't release, won't be released until 2026. That's triggering me because it wasn't a trial. They were technically hearings on the part of regulatory lawsuits and crap. It, complicated but the whole thing was stupid and went nowhere <laughs> at the earliest so i don't know by 2026 two years from now what do we think we'll have a next generation of consoles i think we'll have a next gen of xbox probably announced by the end of the year probably released by the end of the holiday i think we'll have a next gen xbox i don't think sony's gonna expedite i really don't because uh, allegedly they're doing a ps5 pro this winter i mean i just i'd be surprised if they do in two years another generation like i don't know man i don't know man do you guys think we get a ps6 by then i think we get another xbox they've talked about that but i don't think we get another playstation i don't i don't think we're gonna see the next generation 2026 if i had to predict like a year off the top of my head i'd say 2027 at the earliest um for next gen consoles um but you know we're already hearing about sony working on their pro version supposedly um so who knows? Maybe it is closer than we think. Um, I think Elder Scrolls Six is going to be one of those big games. I'm hoping it replaces the Skyrim on every device uh, because, like, that was what Skyrim became known for. Is like, hey, play Skyrim on your fridge with Alexa, uh, or play it on Alexa. You know, play it on your yeah. fridge. Play Skyrim everywhere. And I enjoyed my time with Skyrim, but I'm so over and done with that that <laughs> world at this point. I'm ready to see what's going to happen with six. Like I miss that time period where I came into elder scrolls during Morrowind. And then a few later, like not too long after that, we got oblivion and then we got Skyrim with, you know, obviously incremental windows between each of those, but it was nice to see those coming so much sooner uh, with smaller windows between them. And obviously game development's gotten more expensive. It's gotten uh, tougher. There's a lot more stuff they're trying to cram into these games. So it takes longer, but man, I am so ready for Elder Scrolls 6. I think a lot of people are going to be very, very disappointed. <laughs> I, I'm i telling you what, man. I'm like, how many disappointments in a row do you need to maybe start thinking? Maybe it's them. Maybe they're the problem. Like, seriously. Fallout 4 disappointed a lot of people. Fallout 76, do we need to even talk about it? Starfield disappointed a ton of people. And all... Uh, like all the accounts right now are suggesting that they have no intentions of swapping like creation engine. They have no intention of doing any sort of significant reworking of the studio. There's, um, there was one story where somebody collected on Reddit, a bunch of, um, statements, tweets and stuff from various Bethesda employees and interviews and stuff. And they basically just made the case that nobody at Bethesda looks at any critical feedback. Like <laughs> if somebody doesn't like Starfield, they consider them to be like basically trolls and they just don't acknowledge it. And so they ignore it. And that to me is like, I, I like we've heard it from Emil Pagliarillo. He's been very honest. He's like, yeah, ignore the trolls, ignore the people that hate on you and stuff. And I'm like, that's like, I appreciate the, the desire for good mental health. That's absolutely crucial as a, a game developer, I'm sure. But you got like, you're trying to sell us a product. And if you refuse to acknowledge the problems, like, yeah, it's basically a lolcow. cow. It's refusing 
um, to acknowledge reality. It's being delusional. It's it's being out of touch and all of that. And that's why they've been able to so consistently do things that are just baffling. And you're like, how on earth did you think that that was a good idea? But it's because they just apparently don't respond or look at critical feedback. Um, you know, the, the polar opposite was Hello Games with No Man's Sky. Like in that case, Sean Murray, he got all this overwhelmingly negative feedback when the game launched. And he said, OK, you know what he did? He trolled all of, I guess trolled has a double meaning, but he went in and he collected all of the complaints, all of the frustrations, everybody's suggestions, missing features, all of that. He put it into a spreadsheet. This is all outlined in that internet historian video that was really well done. And he collected all of that. And then he put it together and they started working through them line by line, line by line, line by line, and working to add each of those features and improve what was there. And, um, add new stuff and, and all of that. So he got the overwhelmingly negative feedback for their game, but he confronted it. He faced it head on and dealt with it. But what we see with a lot of these games and studios that collapse in on themselves is that they seemingly refuse to acknowledge any of it. Like we've seen that with, for example, the, the rock steady response to suicide squad, where they're just straight up, not acknowledging the people who have frustrations that like, they can't log in. The fact there's no content, the fact that some people have had all of their progression locked or reset to zero. There were people that grinded the game for two months and then lost everything because the game bugged before the season one update. People that bought skins that can't equip them, all sorts of stuff, and they refuse to even acknowledge it. And all they talk about on social media is like, okay, we know you're having a ton of fun with all the new content that came with season one. It's like, no, everybody unanimously agrees. There's no new content. It's just reskin stuff, but they refuse to acknowledge it. And to that right there shows that they're not actually dealing with the, the critical response. They're just sticking their fingers in their ears and pretending like everything's okay which is not how you deal with problems. Um, you know, Bethesda has done the same thing with Starfield with all of their updates and things that just don't deal with the core issues. They don't want to acknowledge the clear and present issues with all this stuff. They've said they're bringing some fixes for like city maps and stuff. We're still waiting for like all of this stuff. It's, it's just crazy. And similar stuff has happened with Ubisoft where people complain about stuff with Ubisoft all the time and they just haven't really acknowledged it in many instances. So it's a common thread with a lot of these studios that have problems earning trust of their player bases that they often don't uh, engage with criticisms. And it seems like, yeah, I, I agree, Katie Cat. I think you're right. At some point, you need to put aside your feelings and mental issues to deal with criticisms professionally. Yeah, and I mean, Cyberpunk is another great example of how they dealt with it, where they came out and they said, yeah, we screwed up. Now, I still insist that what they did there was like bafflingly unethical. Like they knew that game was running like garbage and they chose to still release it and sell it to people and hide the PS4 and Xbox One versions that they still were selling, but they chose to hide it from consumers so they couldn't see how broken it was before they bought it. That is like a next level of scummy. But for whatever it's worth, they took the criticisms head on because it was kind of hard to pretend like they didn't exist. And they fixed the game over the next two years. They grinded it out. They worked a ton. And then within three years, they put out the Phantom Liberty DLC and it ended up being a, a fantastic kind of capstone to the game. It's unfortunate that they had to spend three years to get there, but at least they got there instead of abandoning it like a lot of other studios would have done. So with all this, I just think that there's a, a frustration I and many other gamers have that there is not an actual acknowledgement of the problems and concerns and shortcomings of like BGS games. And their team seems wholly unaware of the frustrations people have because they're, I'm guessing, instructed not to engage with any of the, the critical feedback. And you can tell because they are doubling down on some of the worst mistakes that they are consistently making. It's it's wild. 2026 seems a little early for the PlayStation 6. Max, how about you? Yeah, same. Um this this game feels like it's going to be it's going to be a ways off. Uh, you know, they've been talking about it for ages. I think even the the reveal trailer that we got in 2018 was I think Todd Howard said something like we put that up just to sort of ward off the torches and pitchforks of people demanding Where's Elder Scrolls mm -hmm. 6? When are we going to get, you know, more Elder Scrolls? And it's, you know, they're like we're going to work on that when we're finished with Starfield. And that was you know, four, four years before Starfield was out, five years, whatever. Like, you know, it, it, it takes a while to make these games. Elder Scrolls Six is just now in like sort of actual, you know, development. I think they said that there are, you know, there are playable builds out there. Uh, 
it's got it's got some it's got some big shoes to fill like yeah you know looking yeah. at you know skyrim is is on so many devices because it is such and just a you know landmark game that like, i feel like that and gta 5 both set such ridiculously high bars that doing a sixth mm -hmm. installment is you know gonna be tricky it's gonna be hard it's mm -hmm. gonna be hard to top that yeah and i mean i think also it's it's almost like some of these games or stories or books or whatever else even films get this sometimes where they're so big the people have stopped kind of looking at them critically. They just take it for granted, you know, where it's like, wait, is this actually good? Or am I just doing this because this is what I do? You know, like is Overwatch 2 actually good? Or am I just playing it? Cause I've been playing Overwatch for years. It's one of those games that's just so massive that I think people have stopped kind of looking at it more critically. And I think Skyrim is, is a triumph of the game in many, many ways. I think if it were to release today, like the same mechanics, but just like say all the animations and the, the, all of the graphics, everything is overhauled and it's just like a full remake, but it's Skyrim still. I think Skyrim released today would be, I don't think it would be anywhere near as, as uh, successful. I, I really don't. And I think it's mainly just because it was an artifact of its time. You know, it, it's very arcadey. It's a very junk food RPG. But I think the gaming community has largely matured. And I think people look for something a little bit more weighty and meaty when it comes to RPGs, especially fantasy RPGs. And as I mentioned with um, Dragon Age Dreadwolf being held and compared to Baldur's Gate 3, I think Elder Scrolls 6 will as well where people are going to be like, okay, but we got this other fantasy game that also has really intense stories and stuff. And, you know, you let me become the professor of the college of magic within 20 minutes of arriving. Like, how am I supposed to take that super seriously? You know, I could, I could see this being a, you know, a tail end of this generation kind of thing. I could also see yeah. Microsoft leaning heavily on using, you know, the next using <laughs> Sky, Skyrim's revenge as, you know, as a, as a Xbox series, Y launch title or what have you. Mm. I mean, the yeah, that is one. I, I think that's actually fair. I think you could see Elder Scrolls six getting pushed to the next gen consoles. I mean, even if it's like a 2027 or 2026 and it launches um, next to the Series X or Series sequel, whatever it is, that would make a lot more sense because Game Pass is more about getting you to buy the membership than it is necessarily about um, trying to sell the most individual units possible. The good news is if they keep uh, going with their smart delivery, like they've done with the Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S, like hopefully that will be less of an issue when it comes to Elder Scrolls Six. Mm -hmm. And of course also Bethesda will have Fallout 5 at some point, but I believe Todd Howard is confirmed that's the project after Elder Scrolls Six. So yeah, it's gonna be a while for that one. Although we're coming up next year, I think will be 10 years since the release of Fallout 4. So it's gonna be a huge Don't gap. Tell me. Don't yeah, tell I'm, me it's been 10 years since Fallout 4, Damon. I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> 2015. Oh Fallout my goodness. Out. That oh, is yeah. so long ago. I know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hard. It's just, it's weird. Some developers like Bethesda, they work at such a protractive development schedule. Like they work on things for years and years and years. And I, I'll, I just don't know what that's like. Because here at IGN, we make stuff every day. We put it up every day. Mm -hmm. It seems just, bizarre to work on something for 10 plus years. I was just talking to a friend about this. But the fact that we are getting a Fallout TV show and like if that if that show is successful we're probably going to have f four or five seasons of that show before the yeah. next fallout game at least and the show might end before we get fallout 5 <laughs> I think that's like not that's very very possible and but, i don't mean like end in a bad way like i think it might just run the course of what the story exactly, they want to tell yeah. and just be yeah. done <laughs> which is sort of a testament to exactly how long it takes to make video games especially on the scale that bethesda works on i mean todd howard has said i think offhandedly that, that fallout 5 is probably going to be his last game um, you know, is in a in a formal for sort of full on creative director capacity, but I can't help but wonder, are we going to see Microsoft license out Fallout? Like, obviously, that is a you know Bethesda. That's Bethesda's mm -hmm. baby. That's one of their one of their babies. It's that and Elder Scrolls are the two the crown jewels of their library or whatever. But you know, under under the new sort of Microsoft Studio stables, you've also got In Exile, which was founded by one of the original developers of Fallout. You've got Obsidian, which made New Vegas. Like, there's there's you've got like. <laughs> You've got all these estranged, you know, you've got, you've got all the original members of the band in the same, you know, in the same tour bus, like just make them pick up the instruments. But uh, I'd be, I'd be super cool to see them do maybe not like a full on Fallout 5, but a New Vegas like thing where it's sort yeah. of a, you know, a parallel thing. Or maybe, and this is, this might sound sort of blasphemous, but something that shakes things up, like maybe 
you know, maybe remake one or two, like maybe remake tactics, maybe create something like, you know, obviously Bethesda kind of revolutionized the idea of a, of an open world RPG by making it more, you know, first person, more immersive with, you know, Fallout 3 and, you know, Oblivion, stuff like that, like very much kind of changing the perspective. But Baldur's Gate 3 proved that there's still very much demand for this sort of, you know, isometric turn-based yeah. click around, mm -hmm. you know, CRPG. I think they did show that, but it's got to be on a scale and depth level that I don't think many studios are capable of delivering. I do think that we probably, this is my, my big ball prediction. Okay, you ready? I think we probably do see Microsoft give Obsidian specifically the Fallout franchise in the next few years to do like a, a new Vegas 2 or something like that. I mean, come on. It just makes too much sense. Like he said, you've got all the members of the band together in the tour bus. Make them pick up the instruments. Just like, just do it. And with Microsoft, like they own the tour bus. They own all the people in the tour bus. That sounds bad, but basically they do. Like they can make it happen if they really want to. And I think if, if Phil goes to Todd and is like, listen, bro, you're not getting the Fallout 5 probably until like 2033, 2034, realistically. Like, I know that's insane to think about, but that's probably what it is. So we're going to give the Fallout IP to Obsidian for a bit. They're going to make a Fallout New Vegas 2, or they're going to remake it or something, or they give it to another studio to remake and do that. And you'll get the franchise back in eight years or whatever it will have been by then with Fallout 5. But we're like, we're not going to let the franchise just sit dormant for ages. You know, like I, I think it's just, it makes way too much sense to do something with the franchise. That's just sitting on ice. You have a show that's going to drive engagement. You have a show that's going to get people interested in it for the first time, as we've seen happen with the last of a show. And you're not going to have anything new to pitch to them or to sell to them. That's crazy. Like, that's insane. You're leaving money on the table. That's outrageous. And you're right, Mr. Sev. Like, it is not outside the realm of possibility, especially if the Elder Scrolls Six lands at, like, 2028, 2029, if it gets delayed or something. It's not outside the realm of possibility that Fallout 5 could come at, like, 2034, 2035. 20 years after Fallout 4. That's insane. But that's what happens when it takes five, six years to develop games, and you put a few in between. Like, that's just what happens. So it just doesn't make any sense, as far as I can tell, to leave the franchise dormant that long. And maybe this is a controversial take. I don't think Fallout 76 is enough. <laughs> I think you need something a little bit more than Fallout 76 to keep the franchise active. Because based on interviews and stuff, that seems to be the most likely purpose behind Fallout 76, beyond just quick cash. It seems like they didn't, they realized that it was going to be a while before we got Fallout 5. So they're like, okay, well, we'll do Fallout 76 and that will keep Fallout fans happy until we make that game. And what they've hopefully realized is that the people who like Fallout 76 probably also like Fallout 4 and Fallout 5, but it's a very small subset of those groups. Like, it's a very small subset. So, like, most of the people that are clamoring for another Fallout game are not hopping on Fallout 76 to get that fix, you know, especially after everything that went down with it. Um, yeah, by the way, I do have the Todd Howard candle burning. We lit it at the top of the stream. So he is with us in mind and spirit. Indeed. Indeed he is. As we say, praise be. Praise be to Todd. Blessings upon him and also with you all together. There we go. Okay, switching things up uh, with more of a Sony focus, we've got Fizzent, codenamed Fizzent from Hideo Kojima. <laughs> this is going to be his uh, return to the stealth action espionage genre he um, popularized with Metal Gear Solid. And But we also know he's got Death Stranding 2 coming next year and then OD for Xbox, which, you know, Presumably will come after that, maybe a year or two later. So Fizzent is a little bit of a ways off. They are partnering with Sony on this one. I am also going to make a, a balls to the walls prediction here. I think Fizzent or whatever it ends up actually being called. I think it's going to be a pile of incomprehensible garbage because Kojima has already said repeatedly that he wants to merge film and cinema to make it much closer to like a, a brand new experience and everything. And all Kojima can talk about when he references this project is that he wants to blend the lines between film 
and gaming and everything. So I think it's just going to basically be an interactive movie. I, I mean, I think that's going to be pretty much the whole thing. You know, they filmed the video of him revealing it on like the Sony soundstage where they film movies and stuff. Like, I, I just really don't think people are expecting it's going to be Metal Gear Solid, but with like a new spin to it. No, I think it's going to be just a, an interactive movie, basically, but without the branching story stuff, because Kojima doesn't do that. And Kojima's writing is some of the most asinine, verbose, high school grade writing I've ever come across in the gaming industry. So I don't uh, expect it to be particularly good, but I'm trying to, I'm going to get flack for that. I just, at this point, every time I've heard him talk about it, I'm like, this doesn't sound good. Like I, like, I just don't get it. You know, <laughs> I hope I'm proven wrong, but it's probably also like a decade out. We'll see. Yeah. It's probably going to be just pure insanity. I, but that's the thing is Kojima since he left Konami has just been allowed to do whatever he wants. And it's steadily gotten like more and more wacky which some people love. I mean, don't get me wrong. That can be wacky and crazy and fun. But I, I would expect him to just go even more crazy. Like the level of Death Stranding was already pretty crazy. And then we got Death Stranding 2. And the trailer is like, he's actually making like, he's got a, a guitar weapon that he's like playing to zap electricity at people. and And it's like, just pure insanity there's a talking doll like it's actually crazy and this is just one notch higher on the dial so imagine what it's going to be like in a few games after he's gotten all of those thoughts out where's like five levels higher than this like straight up my my thing where i was like years ago or a year ago i was like oh i should make my own trailer for a death stranding 2 before they had announced it and like i'll, I'll make it using ai art and stuff and I'll just be super obscure about it. But I'll be like, yeah, it's it's just a bunch of actors come out and they start crying gummy bears out of their eyes. And then they go and they put their hands on rocks and they lift it off and it's all black from the handprint. And then you turn around and then it's just raining gumdrops, but the gumdrops turn into crying babies before they hit the ground. And then he turns around again. And then there's Mother Teresa there with a guitar. And then she flips it around her back and starts playing the drums. And then the Queen of England comes out and starts doing a satanic ritual where she peels her face apart. Like just the most insane stuff ever. And I'd put it out and people would be like, this is a Kojima game. Brilliant, stunning, brave. <laughs> and I'm like, nope. I dropped a bunch of acid and uh, and I, I went on a bender for six days. And this is the brain rot child of that. But people, if they thought it was Kojima, would just be like, that was stunning. That was so brave. <laughs> it's crazy. Like it's it actually drives me a little crazy because I'm like, if anybody else were doing this exact same thing, you'd be like, get them some help. But with Kojima, everybody's like, OK, that sounds fantastic. It's stunning, brave and beautiful, you know. Stop giving them ideas. Yeah, Luke, you clearly stole that from Kojima. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do we think? Is there any sort of uh, possibility this might be a, play a PlayStation 6 launch title? I think this is I... the only thing on this list that is specifically has been referred to as a next-gen game. Mm. Like, I think this is going to be a PS6 mm -hmm. launch title. I don't know if it's going to be a launch title. Uh, go ahead and finish your point, but yeah, I don't think yeah, it's going to be a launch. It'll be, it'll be a launch title the way that Metal Gear Solid 4 was a PS3 launch title, if you know what gotcha. I'm saying. Like it's yeah, gonna, yeah. it's gonna come out eighteen months into the into okay. the console life cycle, but the launch yeah. window. It's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a sort of yeah. How he's describing it, Sony does not only make games, uh, not only does games, but also music and movies. It will definitely be a strong collaboration. Two years from now, I will celebrate the fortieth anniversary of my game production career. I'm confident this title will be the culmination of my work. So anyway, I'm expecting it to just be like total insanity. It's going to be hyper experimental. It probably won't make any damn sense, but people will call it brave and stunning. That's my full expectation. PS6, something along those lines. But the weird thing is Kojima is finally, uh, you know, his body is what, 70% movies, something like that. And <laughs> <Yeah>. he's <laughs> officially formally, you know, going to be like, this is going to be partially a, a film thing, I think. Like the mm -hmm. reveal was that weird panning drone shot it then had you know the Columbia Pictures logo next to Bizant. Like that's yeah, I, it's just going to be interesting to see what happens there. So I fully expect. It, I mean, it could very well be like a a real time live action game where like, did you ever play that game? Um, 
what was it called? It was like Amelie or Emily or something where it was like, it was filmed as an actual like film. Was it Erica? Where did they get Amelie? Yeah, 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 yeah. This one, four years ago, I did this. That's funny. So it's, it's like an interactive thriller, but it's straight up just filmed as a, a movie. And then you can kind of pick and choose your own adventure. And there's some interesting stuff. I mean, I, I thought it was a really interesting and different experience. It's not very long. It's it's kind of cool. Like they did this like stop motion thing where you're actually moving and uh, controlling it in real time. It's pretty interesting. It's very different, very different. But this is kind of what I expect this next Kojima game to be. And they'll call it like espionage. So instead of like pressing dialogue options, you probably are going to be like, hide behind the boxes, swipe. And it's going to be something like that. Because I think what I get from Kojima is that he just really wants to make a movie and that's all he's wanted to do for a long time. You follow him on Twitter, everything he posts is about movies and soundtracks and stuff that he's watching and listening to. So I fully expect that he's just going to use it as an opportunity to finally make a movie and then it'll be framed as a game and it's just going to be pure insanity. That's my uh, that's my guess. Cuz he's he's always about sort of pushing the pushing the boundaries of the medium and I don't know. He's. I feel like he's got. He's got Sony's full attention. So I'd like to see what they do with that. Uh, yeah. If I have to buy a PS6 to, to to see it, then sure. Why not? So be we're it. Gonna be, we're going to be controlling actors playing the game to watch the game as a movie. It's it's, it's, it's going to be. That is unironically probably what it is. Yes. <laughs> so let me play that back again. So be we're it. Gonna be, we're going to be controlling actors playing the game to watch the game as a movie. It's, it's, it's gonna yeah. be just profound, stunning, brave, and beautiful. All sorts of levels. <laughs> well, looking internally at Sony, what about Naughty Dog? Is Naughty Dog gonna go this whole uh, generation without shipping a new game? The whole PS5 generation? That'd be kind of crazy. I don't yeah. I don't think that is gonna be the case, but I know they are, you know, we also they did have to cut their losses on the multiplayer, um, which would have been their big PS5 game. Mm -hmm. um, but they cut their losses on it because it just wasn't working for them. It wasn't, you know, what where their heart was. It just didn't make sense for their studio. Um, it'd be it'd be really surprising to not see them this generation, um, just minus the obvious we got the remake and of one right. and remaster of part two right. for Last of Us. Um, but not seeing a new title like a brand new thing would be really crazy with how much of a pedigree Naughty Dog is in Sony's like. Uh, band of developers. I mean, there's a couple layers to this. If you watch the documentary on uh, the making of The Last of Us Part Two, or my reaction to it, that was three hours long, there's a few interesting developments. For one, they worked on the multiplayer game for years and it went nowhere. I think it probably was canceled because the new COO came in, reevaluated everything, and they told him and Sony leadership, like, hey, you're going to lose out on all Naughty Dog first player games if we do this, because we'll have to just be a live service support studio. Jim Ryan wants that, but can you please step in and not let him do that? And they said, oh, yeah, no. And so all at the same time, we get that canceled. Jim Ryan announces retirement. All this stuff happens. My conspiracy theory, I think it's all connected. I think Jim Ryan screwed up and the COO kind of welcomed him to leave and undid a lot of the the poopy decisions he had made but time will tell maybe in 10 years we'll find out if that's true or not either way it doesn't really matter what matters is that they've wasted a ton of time hundreds of millions of dollars working on an online game that didn't see the light of day we uh, we know they're working on other stuff on the side as well but the full production was basically put into the online game that's gone nowhere so a lot of time has been wasted on that we might still see, you know, a game by the end of this generation, but it's still probably, I mean, if we say that they cut their losses last year and then they've been doing pre-production on other stuff, like do they, let's say that they started technically working on that new game full-time last year, you give it three, four years, like we're starting to approach the end of the generation. So it could be like an Uncharted 4 type of thing. Well, not even. It's probably more like The Last of Us Part Two thing, where they drop a game right before the end of the generation. It's one of the last games to come out on the, the PS5, and then they'd start getting back to the regular schedule of things. The other piece of this, too, is that they have spoken very openly that they want to get rid of grind. Naughty Dog was known to have some of the worst grind in the industry. It was a well-known thing. If you wanted to work at Naughty Dog, great. You'll make some great games, but buckle up, because... 
you're going to be grinding a lot. And it was kind of part of the company culture that apparently is it, like it's gone after COVID after the last of us part two, a lot of the devs were burnt out and were just so done with it that they were like, we're going to just leave the game industry. Like we just can't do this again. So they reevaluated and they're like, okay, no more grind. None of that. And, or yeah, crunch crunch. If I've been saying grind the whole time, I meant crunch. Yeah. So they, they've tried to get rid of all that crunch, get rid of it so that now you just come nine to five, you do your job, you go home, we'll release the game when it's ready. That's it. And I think that that's admirable. I mean, I, I think that's, uh, they deserve a lot of credit for that because that's a huge change to how it used to work. The, the other side of that though, because everything, you know, has a, an equal and opposite reaction. The other side of that is that games are going to take longer to make. If they're not getting people to work an extra four or five hours a day by staying late, that time has to go somewhere and it's just going to get added to the dev cycle. So you probably see games from Naughty Dog take even longer. I mean, uh, The Last of Us Part Two took four years from Uncharted 4. Um, so if we say that it then takes like five years now, it adds a year or something to get rid of crunch. If they started development like this past year, basically in full force, maybe they did a lot of pre-production in 2022 leading in. We're still probably at like 2027 to 2028, which is crazy. Yeah, I know Neil is traveling a lot. He sent pictures or he posted pictures on Twitter or something of him traveling in Japan, I think. So he's he's off on vacation or something. I don't know. Yeah, there's the multiplayer thing. Juckman has talked about Last of Us Part 3, but it's like it's just an idea at this point. It's not in development. Max, what is, uh, is, is there like an, another, a new IP from Naughty Dog that's been announced or is this just a rumor? Right There's now? nothing, nothing announced, but there are these pictures. This sounds completely screwball, wingnut, you know, just crackpot theories. There are some images that popped up on a, you know, literal bulletin board inside The Last of Us Part One of what appear to be unicorns or some kind of magical, whimsical horses and characters we've never seen before. And they look either like really, you know, high definition concept art or like screenshots from something. And people are speculating that maybe, maybe uh, Naughty Dog's next game is going to be something fantasy oriented, something that is, you know, shaking up, shaking up genres. Very different. I feel like they've veered very heavily into, into grounded realism. You know, they went from, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Crash Bandicoot to Jack and Baxter <laughs> to Uncharted to The Last of Us. And mm -hmm. short of making, you know, a video game version of like, a marriage story or something like that you can't really get <laughs> grittier or more grounded than the last of us so i think they're going to try to kind of pull up a little bit and go another direction i could be completely wrong i'm just speculating here but you know they yeah. do have a track record for teasing their next projects kind of like in the pixar style of things where you sprinkle in mm -hmm. some little easter eggs and breadcrumbs and other detritus like that but people are thinking that these you know these images which were not in the original version of the last of us may be a clue about mm -hmm. what's coming down the pipe yeah i don't know i'm in the middle i'm in the middle because some of these like like that looks like it could be concept art. Same with that. Like I can see that being concept art. These look like quick sketches or something. Like, I don't know how that would be useful. I don't know. Do you guys think that this is, yeah, chat is that real chat? So I don't know. Do you guys think that this is real? Do you buy this? Maybe it's just a kid's wall. I think their point is that this was not in the original game. So somebody had to intentionally add this. And if somebody's going to intentionally add this, they had to go in and create concept art or art like this to put in the game because this hasn't been found anywhere else. You, like I would imagine you can't just do a reverse image search, but I can try that. It's searching it. It's not finding anything similar. So it's not like they took this off of like a stock image site or something like they, they created this image. So if they created these images, why did they like, this is a lot of effort to go to for a quick thing. Most people are not going to notice. It does look AI generated maybe, but this, but this was even like, this was back September, 2022. So it's probably put in the game in early 2022, late 21 when it was in development and like AI tools were not this good quite yet. And I think also Naughty Dog doesn't use AI concept art or anything. I don't think that's been said. So. I don't know. Could be, could be totally, totally unrelated, or it could be a little nod. Like this one I think is the most compelling because this looks like it was actually drawn by somebody and it just seems like an odd thing to put into a game. Seems odd, but I mean, it could be interesting if they go fantasy after all of this giant serpent. You can see the, the tail of it right here, circling all the way up over like the triangle thing. I don't know. Very different. Very weird. Very, very weird. 
I hadn't heard that before. Interesting. Max coming out with the, the crazy reveals. Also the Savage Starlight comics that they've teased in throughout the, the Last of Us part one and I think part two for sure. I don't remember Savage Starlight comics were in the first one. It's been a minute since I did the collectibles in that one. Um, but maybe that does point. Savage Starlight does kind of scream that fantasy element. So, and, you know, they did a lot of, uh, they committed really hard to like Ellie being a big fan of space and, you know, the whole, mm -hmm. the, the whole space pod sequence. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we get something like that. And looking at Remedy, Remedy just put out, Alan Wake 2, um, they've got Control 2 announced. I actually think Control 2 it's, would probably make it out this gen. Control was 2019 for that first one. But what about Max Payne 1 and 2 Remake? We think that would be an, a next gen game? I think, I think if they're really focusing on getting Control 2 out this generation, Max Payne 1 and 2 will probably be a cross-platform launch, mm -hmm. um, would be my guess. Um, it, we learned that it has the budget of Alan Wake 2, uh, I believe is one of the recent reports that came out, which is a big budget for Remedy. Um, so I'm very excited to see what that looks like um, brought into the modern age with a big budget behind it. And Remedy also has this code name Kestrel, which is a multiplayer action game. Uh, it was originally gonna be a free to play game, but they ditched that model and now it's a premium full price game. So I, I think that one's having some issues in development. I wouldn't expect that one out this generation. A couple hmm. more from Ubisoft. <laughs> this one is hilarious. I'm, I'm glad you added it to our list, Jada. Beyond Good and Evil 2. I mean, uh, seriously, at this point, why even bother? At this point, why bother with Beyond Good and Evil 2? Although Ubisoft didn't let go of um, uh, Skull, and Skull and Bones. They put that one out. Yeah, I mean, they said that this is one of two quadruple A games. It's the only studio I know talking about adding an A to game development <laughs> like status for games. Um, and Skull and Bones was supposed to be one of them, and Beyond Good and Evil 2 is supposed to be the other quadruple A game. Um, so it's very interesting to see. I haven't seen Skull and Bones, you know. Uh, I have a couple friends on my friends list playing it regularly on PlayStation, but I, it's not taking the world by storm for being this big quadruple yeah. A game, something you would expect for that. Um, that being said, I know people are hungry still for Beyond Good and Evil 2, despite knowing basically nothing about it other than it's single player and co-op. Um, and the, the little bit of, you know, trailers we got, what, in 2017? Mm -hmm. Um, but we've heard nothing and it's been seven years. So I, I think if Ubisoft doesn't say anything about this in the next two years, uh, it'll definitely be a PS6 title, but Xbox Series Y <laughs> title, um, if we ever even get it. If yeah. it doesn't just like fade away into obscurity and they hope people stop talking about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more in that latter camp because the original was not a huge hit. It's like a, a cult classic, great mm -hmm. game, but you know, it wasn't a, a huge success. To announce a sequel to that game more than a decade later and then keep people waiting on it with no news for almost a decade after that it's like what are, what are we even doing here although ubisoft has had problems recently with getting games out the door max will beyond good and evil 2 ever come out i have to wonder if there's like regulatory things kind of like skull and bones if they they made a deal allegedly with the singaporean government that they had to release it because they took government grants for it um I wonder if there's something going on with Beyond Good and Evil 2 as well. Because it's just, at this point, it's been around for so long and we've just never seen it go anywhere. It's crazy. And the quadruple A thing is crazy too because it's Yves Guimont. He said in an investor call, I believe it was, that these games are quadruple A. And basically, like, he's technically right. In terms of budget, these are closer to quadruple A than triple A. They have spent hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars building these games. But that doesn't mean that therefore players should be willing to pay more or like put up with more. Like, if anything, that means that the quality should be higher. And I think this is the fundamental disconnect between Yves Guimont, the CEO of Ubisoft, and everybody else on the planet, which is that AAA and quadruple A imply a certain level of quality, right? That's when you hear AAA game, you think, okay, in terms of scale, in terms of graphics, in terms of polish, in terms of this and that, it's gonna be up here. You don't think, okay, it's been in development hell, which is what Yves Guimont means by it. Yves Guimont is telling investors, yeah, no, it's quadruple A because we've spent so much money on it. But to everybody else, quadruple A means, okay, so it's like on the level of GTA 6, is that what you're talking about? But that's not what Yves Guimont means. And that's why everybody has rightly 
teased the crap out of him for saying it. And it's turned into like a bigger meme than anything. I mean, in the last six months, I mean, I can't even tell you how many comments I've gotten uh, of people being like, oh yeah, so is this the quadruple A game? Will Ubisoft have a, you know, will Star Wars Outlaws be quadruple A? You know, it, it's turned into a meme because it just reflects being quite out of touch. Um, GTA 6 is probably going to be the first truly, if you want to like open the door to it, probably the first truly quadruple A game, like been in development for ages. It, it is extremely expensive and it probably will still live up to that level of quality that you would expect from quadruple A. By most accounts, it will. But time will tell. We're going to find out. All of this to say, like, I, I think... There's a lot of games that are currently in limbo. I think the fact that Naughty Dog is still up in the air is perhaps the most tragic thing of this generation. It's just that there's a real high possibility that we might not get a Naughty Dog game this generation. That is crazy. It's crazy to see them be so prolific for so long with like, you know, they, they did Uncharted 2 and then Uncharted 3 and The Last of Us. All I believe all of those were on the PS3. And then they come out with Uncharted 4 and the, like The Last of Us Part 2 with the PS4. And then PS5, they just do remakes and remasters. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, and it pretty much by every uh, account that I can come up with, it all lands back on, on uh, Jim Ryan. Because it's like, well, yeah, man, you had them working on an online game that didn't go anywhere for four or five years. Wasted all that money, all that time. It's crazy. They did Lost Legacy. Yeah, that was like a, a secondary team. It was meant to be initially like a DLC spinoff. Um, then it turned into a standalone game that I think they sold for like, for I think it was 40 bucks at launch. Um, so you're right. They did also do that. And that was technically also PS4. <laughs> for the love of God, Naughty Dog just remastered Jack and Daxter trilogy. I don't think they would do it. I, I don't think Sony would let them do it. I think Sony would look at them and be like, no, you guys are like world class. We're not going to have you doing remasters of decade plus old games. We're going to have you do remasters of either something we think like we know is going to sell ridiculously well, like The Last of Us Part Two, or we'll have you just make a new game. Um, and the other piece of it, too, is apparently the remake of The Last of Us Part One and The Last of Us Part Two remaster, those both were used as training for new hires. So they brought people in and then had them like get familiarized with the tools in the engine and everything by working on those projects. So the like the more experienced guys have been working on the online game and whatever Neil Druckmann's working on, but uh, it, it's not like they had the the A team working on those. When is the Last of Us Part Two remaster remake coming out? I'm that's a great question. I am also hotly awaiting that. <laughs> Took my thing! <laughs>